In the Gospel reading today, we hear about our Lord's first miracle that he worked at the wedding feast at Cana. And this brings to fulfillment the time of Epiphany. If we think about it, there were three things that showed initially our Lord's divinity. The first was the star to all of the, uh, to, to all of the nations. The second, what we celebrated just yesterday, the, which was also the octave day of the Epiphany, was the baptism of our Lord. And at that time, the skies were open, the Holy Spirit descended upon our Lord, and the voice of the Father was heard saying, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And so we, well, I guess the listen to him, that was, that was from the, uh, the, the transfiguration, not the baptism. Nonetheless, the fact that the voice of the Father was heard, but it was John the Baptist who heard that. So we aren't sure that all the people did, but John the Baptist did to be able to recognize who our blessed Lord was. Now we have his first miracle, and we are told that his disciples believed in him when they saw what had happened. And so there is a widening group of people who believe. At the same time, what we recognize is that in each of these occasions, there are still people who don't. And even the ones to whom this was revealed, there are still questions. For instance, okay, St. John the Baptist saw the Spirit descend upon our Lord, and he said that he had been told by God that the one upon whom the Spirit would descend, this is the one. And yet we also know that when Jesus, that when John was in prison, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one or should we look for another? So even though this sign was given to him, there were still questions. Today we are told that his disciples believed in him because they saw this sign which he had worked at, at Cana. And yet we also know the struggles that they had believing. It's certainly understandable. All you have to do is think about anybody that you know. If for whatever reason you thought this person had some kind of gift from God, maybe they're a prophet or maybe they're whatever, even if you thought, for instance, that they were the Messiah. Obviously, you know that's not the case, but let's say that you were thinking that because all these indicators are there. And still you might say, but I, I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, out of all the people to ever have walked the face of the earth, there is one person who is going to be the Messiah. So out of billions and billions of people, we're going to say this one is he. Is that reasonable to say that? We need to be absolutely certain. And so just the fact that he works some miracles, we can look back in the Old Testament and we can see some of the prophets did the same. And so the miracles by themselves, <clears throat> while they point to the fact that our Lord is, <clears throat> is the Messiah, they don't prove that he's the Messiah. Even though he himself told us, that if you don't want to believe in the words I speak, at least believe in the works, because they saw what he did. But even raising the dead, the prophet Elisha did the same thing. God did it through the prophet Elisha. And so we see that the miracles that our Lord worked, yes, they are greater than the miracles that the prophets worked. And yet at the same time, one would still be wondering, is this really the one? And so it's a question then that we have to ask ourselves. Do we believe? Again, you could sit here and say, well, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't believe. I'm not asking, again, the question of whether you know in your head what the truth is, because obviously you do. I'm asking the question of what's in the heart. Now, granted, faith is an intellectual virtue, but faith by itself 
is not sufficient. As we see in the first reading, the Christian life has to be about charity. St. Paul goes through all these different points about how we are to practice charity. So once that faith is there, now it needs to be acted upon. And that action has to be one of charity. St. Paul even going so far as to talk about the fact that we have to practice fraternal charity. But we have to look at our motive of why we're doing what we're doing. And we have to look then at how much faith we really have. Because if the motive becomes one of selfishness, which is a very easy trap to fall into, you could look at what St. Paul is talking about and all the different grace, graces that people have been given, and they could use that for their own glory. And we know that that even happens. People today are still comparing to one another. Oh, I can do this and I can do that. Who cares? If God has given you a gift, then use it for the glory of God and the good of others. And understand if there is a charismatic gift that has been given, it says absolutely zero about the holiness of the person who has it. Because the charismatic gifts are given for the sake of someone else, not for the individual who has it. And so when St. Paul goes through all these different gifts and graces, he talks about prophecy and he talks about ministering and he talks about teaching and exhorting and giving and presiding and acting in mercy. Each one of us has been given by God a variety of gifts. And so look within your own self and ask, what has God given to me? But then be very, very careful not to compare yourself to someone else. Oh, I wish I had that one. Praise God that someone else has that one. Because God didn't give all the graces to everyone. He gave some to one and some to another and different ones to a different person. All so that we could serve one another. If you had all of the gifts, you wouldn't have to be dependent on anyone. You wouldn't have to glorify God for the gifts that he'd given to someone else because you already have them. You no, know, he didn't give them all to everybody. So you have certain graces and gifts that God has given to you. And now ask yourself, am I using those for the glory of God? Or do I seek attention from these things? Am I looking for my own glory with something that was given to me? Remember, St. Paul says, name something that you have that you didn't receive. And he said, if you received it, why are you boasting about it as though it was your own? If God has given something to you, he has given it to you to glorify him and to serve others. Now, if there is one person who was granted gifts that were more than any other, and there is, that would be our Blessed Lady. And look at what she did with her gifts. Not once was there anything selfish. And if there is anybody that we could have said, well, this one has the right to boast. This one has the right to strut around and let the rest of us know that we are way lower than she is and that she is the mother of God after all. Did she ever do that? No. Everything was for the glory of God and for the good of others. We even see that in the gospel reading today. 
when she comes to our Lord and intercedes with him because the wine had run out at the wedding. Now our Lord's response, when we put it in English, doesn't sound too very good. Literally, it says, woman, what is this to you and to me? It almost sounds like, get out of my face, leave me alone. That's not what it says. It's actually a Hebrew idiom. And to use woman, for instance, is not a put down. That was just normal Hebrew. So he's not being disrespectful to his mother. He's not putting his mother down. But you see that what Our Lady is doing, not merely interceding on behalf of this couple, because she understands exactly what this is going to mean. And that's why our Lord is asking the question. If he does this, everything begins that is going to lead to the crucifixion. And is she ready for that? That's what that exchange is about. So yes, it is an act of kindness toward this couple who ran out of wine. But the fact that Our Lady would ask Our Lord to do something about that, something that she obviously knew was going to draw attention to who he is, which is exactly what needed to happen, not for his sake, but for his apostle's sake. They needed to believe in who he was. And so again, we look at ourselves then and say, okay, Our Lady is interceding with her son, always on our behalf. But do we have that faith? Do we believe? Do we have that confidence in the Lord? We know in the apostles, even though we're told that they believed when they saw what happened at Cana, we know that all the other events that happened over the next three and a half years, their faith grew and grew and grew and grew. And then when it came time for that ultimate moment that their faith needed to be there, it failed. Even Peter, who was so confident in himself, even if everyone else should deny you, I will not. So he goes out and denies them three times. They lock themselves in a room because they're terrified of the effects of their faith. And so again, for us, we need to look at those kinds of questions. So right at the beginning now of this time of the year, the church puts this gospel reading for us to be able to say, Jesus is the one. Do you believe that? And again, not in your heads, in your heart. Do we really believe so that we put it into practice? so that we live it. If Jesus truly is the one, then we need to look to him. We need to be dependent on him. We need to trust him. We need to count on him for everything. And as things progress, this year I think is going to be, well, let's just say rather interesting, (laughs) very interesting your faith is going to be shaken. And it's not just going to be for this year. If that faith is not solidly in place, what are we going to do? Try to rely on ourselves? Good luck. We should all know better than that. But then who are we going to rely on? We have to rely on the Lord. And if we don't have that faith deep within us, that kind of faith that we see in the apostles after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit fills them, 
So it wasn't that they didn't believe because we're told point blank that they believed. We have Peter even acknowledging, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He had it up here. There wasn't a problem with what was in his head. But there was clearly a problem with what was in the heart. It wasn't solid yet, it wasn't firm. That's what we all have to look at. And the way that we can look at that is the question of charity. If that faith is firmly there, it's going to be shown in the way that we live, in the way that we treat others, in the way that we glorify God, in the way that we accept the gifts that have been given to us and put them into practice for the glory of God and the good of others. So again, just look at your own self and ask, does that sound like me? Go back and read that first reading and ask again, does that sound like what I'm doing? And look at it humbly because again, what we'd like to do is say, of course, it sounds just like me. Yeah, I got it. If you have that kind of an attitude, we don't have it. We need to be humble and we need to be charitable and we need to be dependent on our Lord. And as we move forward, this is going to become more and more and more critical. And so praise God that the church in her wisdom gives us these readings right in a row to be able to manifest who Jesus is. And then for us then to be able to look at that manifestation and then look at the consequences of it. There is no doubt about who Jesus is. He is the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. He is God. He took a human nature from his mother. He is the Christ. He is the only one. He is the one foretold. You can go through all the different things. There is only one who fits everything. But that's all up in the head. Even Satan can acknowledge all of that. But Satan will not allow the faith to go any deeper. So it's not whether we know the truth, it's whether we believe it and whether we have it in our heart so that we can live it.